Well, I am so grateful to be able to stand up here today and continue this series on living proof. We are in this series that it really, it's, it's the power that we have through the power of the Holy Spirit to be difference makers to our culture, to show a, a generation, this is what God looks like. This is what God's nature is like. And we can't do that. I know, I know Patty. And I know that the best I can do is the best I can do. I have limits, but listen, the power of the Holy Spirit that lives in us, He empowers us so that the best we can do is the best that God can do through us. And I don't know if you've been listening to this series at all and kind of feeling like you just have a big F on your forehead, like, well, I'm, I'm certainly missing the mark in all of these things. As a matter of fact, I wanna read to you our key text. And I just pray today that the Holy Spirit would set us free, that this is not about striving harder. This is not about just working in our own strength. This is really about drawing closer to God and allowing His work to take place in us. Listen to our, our key scripture here for this series. It's Galatians 5, 22 and 23. But the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives, and he goes on to describe it. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. You know, sometimes um, we're like, well, God, I, I just, I'm not seeing these things in my life. You know, and, and it's good for us to do an inventory. I think that's very important to go, God, I'm, I, I don't feel your love or your patience flowing through me, your kindness, your, your gentleness in the way I'm responding in, in the midst of all that's going on or in the midst of my own family drama or relationships or whatever kind of ship that you find yourself on. Sometimes it's hard for us to do that. And I love what, what Jesus said. In John 15, five, he says, I am the vine and you are the branch. Those who remain in me. This is a time for us to press in and to remain in him, to cling to him, to know him more. And I in them, you will produce much fruit for apart from me, you can do nothing. He just, he answers the question for us. It's not about what you can do, it's about what he can do through us. And he says in Philippians 1, 6, I who began a good work in you, oh, trust me, I'm gonna bring it to completion. I am more committed to advancing my purposes and my work in you than you yearn for that to happen. So what does goodness look like? We're, we're in this fruit of the spirit on goodness this week. We've covered love, joy, peace, patience, kindness. If you've missed any of these, these have all just been, the Holy Spirit's just been showing up and showing off. He really has been and just really speaking to our hearts. And I pray that, that you have experienced him because I really believe this. Before we can reflect God's nature, we need to experience his nature. We need to experience these things in our own life. We need to know them to be true so that we can surrender to the work of the Holy Spirit. Listen to these definitions on goodness. Goodness is an attitude of generous kindness to others. It's happy to do far more than is required by justice. So it just doesn't say, well, this is what I, I just should do, but it does far more. Generosity is really a key in this whole definition of goodness. It's not stagnant, but it is always looking for ways to actively work itself out. It's characterized by being warm-hearted, considerate, generous, and sympathetic. It's so modeled in the life of Christ, that selfless love that always lives out our life for the benefit of others. Only the Spirit of God can empower us to do that. You know, the book of uh, Romans, Paul uses this book to really describe the implications of what the death and the resurrection has, the impact that it's had in our life. And throughout the book of Romans, you know, you see the goodness of God. It, one verse after another, after another. I just read through the book of Romans this last week, and I have been so overwhelmed by God's generosity and his goodness. Listen to some of these scriptures. 
that describe what God has done, the implications of Jesus' death and resurrection, the goodness of God poured out on us. With undeserved kindness, he declares us righteous. His goodness declares us righteous, not because of what you've done, but because of what Jesus did on your behalf. Through Christ, he freed us from the penalty and the power of sins. This is goodness. He brought us into a place of undeserved privilege in which we now stand. I want you to know something today. You are standing in a place of undeserved privilege because Jesus has brought you into this place by his goodness. Our Lord Jesus Christ has made us friends of God. He gives life to our mortal bodies. He calls us children of God. He helps us in our weakness. He prays for us. He causes everything going on in your world and in our world collectively to work together for good because he loves us. He's called us according to his purpose. He's, by his goodness, he's brought us into right standing with himself. He will never condemn us. Nothing can separate us from his love, that's his goodness. He says, there's no power on earth, there's no circumstance, there's no failure in your life that will ever separate you from me. That is goodness. He fills us with unique gifts so that we can serve him well. Now, before Paul ever wrote these words, reflecting all of the implications of what Jesus' death and resurrection did for us, to where we could now live by grace, not by our own works, not trying to strive to be made right with God, but by his finished work on the cross. Before Paul ever wrote one word of that, he experienced the goodness of God. We've, we've talked just a couple of months ago about Paul's encounter with God, on, with Jesus on the Damascus road. And then Paul was so transformed by the spirit of God that he said, my life now, I have one life mission. And really, I have taken this verse and I've embraced it for my life mission. And it's, it's in Acts 20, verse 24. He says, I consider my life worth nothing to me. My only aim is to finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me, the task of testifying to the good news of Jesus Christ. I don't care what success I have. I don't care what fame, what kind of money is in my bank account, what, what influence I have. It means nothing to me if I don't accomplish what Jesus has asked me to do. That's, that is the purpose of my life. Now, it is, I think it's easy to see God's goodness and to wanna live out his goodness when life is up and to the right. Isn't it kind of easier to see it? Man, God is so good. God is so good. And we testify to that. But sometimes, I don't know if in 2020, if you have felt this, like I have felt that, there doesn't seem to be much that's been up and to the right. I haven't, I haven't witnessed much going on in our culture that looks like it's up and to the right. But God wants us to experience his goodness, not just when life is up and to the right. What Paul's life represents is, I wanna show you how to experience, to know the goodness of God in the hardest circumstances, in the hardest places that we walk through. I want you to know something, God is still a good God and his goodness, he's chasing us with his goodness. He's pursuing us with his goodness. He's causing things to work out for good in our life in the midst of circumstances that look everything but goodness. And one of my very favorite passages in scripture, and two weeks ago, my Bible reading brought me to this passage, and I just couldn't get away from it. As a matter of fact, this week, I was um, listening to a podcast, and this very text came up again, and I had just been just reflecting on it the week before, and I wasn't even scheduled to speak today. And not until later in this month, but I, I came outside to, and asked her, I think I'm supposed to share this week. And this is just like bubbling up in me and I'm just so grateful that I can, can talk and testify of the goodness of God. Because, in, and I want us to turn over to Acts 27 because this is a picture, I think, it so reflects what is going on in our lives right now in 2020. Paul is... Here, he's been called to advance the gospel. 
And yet he finds himself arrested because the Jews have just said, oh, he's just causing riots out there. He's just destroying everything good. He's preaching this good news of the gospel. He, he is put on trial for preaching the gospel. And, and so Paul appeals, he says, I'm appealing to Caesar. I mean, I'm called to get the gospel out. I might as well start from the head down, right? And just start a wildfire of revival. And so Paul knows that he is to go to Rome. And God had told him that you'll stand before kings and emperors. You'll preach the gospel. And so he, he has boarded a merchant ship. And it's also, it's filled with prisoners. And he's on his way to Rome. Now, on his way to Rome, I want, I'm going to just highlight some key verses. We're going to read through this Acts 20. Just, I'm, it's going to be a little truncated, but we're going to move through this. And I want to see if you can relate to any of these verses, okay? He's starting out, verse 4. But we sailed with difficulty, for the winds were against us. Have you ever felt like, gosh, I'm trying to navigate and walk in your purposes, God, but it feels like the winds are against us. Verse 7, and the wind did not allow us to hold our course. So now I don't know what's happening. God, I know I'm in your path, but this is, does not feel like your course. Okay, verses 9 through 11, and we lost a lot of time. The weather was becoming dangerous for sea travel because it was so late in the fall. And so Paul, he spoke to the ship's officers about it. He said, I don't think we should travel, but they ignored him. Now it's not even sailing weather and they're out there in the middle of the sea. Do you ever feel like you're moving forward in God's purposes, but this is not the time to be sailing forward? This is like the time to find a safe bay and maybe we just rest for a while. And yet, and yet they're right out in the middle of it. Like people aren't taking financial risks right now, but here we go. We're laying everything on the line in this season that this does not feel like the time to be hoisting our sail and sailing forward. But here we are. And instead of getting easier, what happened? It became harder the journey became harder. Verses 14 and 15, before very long, we're not talking just a wind anymore. We're talking a wind of hurricane force called the Northeaster swept down from the island. The ship was caught by the storm and could not head into the wind. We had to give way to it. And we were just driven along. Do you ever feel like, I don't, I don't even feel like anything in our, in our culture today is in control. God, this has gotten so out of control. I feel like we're just being driven along. I, we don't even know where this is gonna take us. Maybe it's circumstances in your home, in your life right now, that it's like, God, I, there's like a storm of hurricane strength that's come upon us. And it's one thing after the other, after the other. It says, we took such a violent battering from the storm that the next day we began to throw the cargo that we thought was necessary for our journey. Now we've thrown it all overboard. I guess we're gonna do without this, okay? On the third day, we even threw the ship's tackle overboard with their own hands. The terrible storm raged for many days, listen to this, blotting out the sun and the stars. Okay, the sun and the stars are what they use to navigate. Oh, it's morning, it's day. It rises in the east, it sets in the west. You couldn't see the sun. There were no stars. There was no navigation. Everything has been blotted out. It's inky pitch blackness in the middle of getting tossed and turned and you can't find your way. And this is what it says, until at last, all hope was gone. They say that, that you can live 40 days without food. You can live what is it, three days without water? You can, the brain can survive seven minutes without oxygen, but you can't even live. You can't even live a minute without hope. Everything begins to spiral when we lose hope. But I love what scripture says in Psalm 139, this is the goodness of God, that darkness is as light to you, God. That God, I can't see but I know you see that God is light, 1 John 1, 5. In you is no darkness at all. 
God, you are the vine, I'm the branch, and I'm gonna remain in you in this darkness because you are light, and in you there's no darkness at all. Verse 21, listen to this. No one had eaten for a long time. Finally, Paul called the crew together, and he said, men, you should have listened to me in the first place. You know, I love Paul. He just had to get that in. He just reminds me, I'm going to encourage you, but first of all, you know, it would have helped all, this whole mess. If you would have listened to me in the first place and not left grief, you would have avoided all this damage and loss. Okay, Paul, move on. But take courage. None of you will lose your lives, even though the ship will go down. For last night, how does he know this? An angel of God to whom I belong and to whom I serve, his presence stood right beside me in the darkness. Gosh. I just hope we can catch this picture here today. And he said, don't be afraid, Paul, for you will surely stand trial before Caesar. And what's more, God in his goodness has granted safety to everyone sailing with you. Everyone from the murderer to the merchant, 276 individuals on that ship were, were going to have, they were going to arrive safely. So take courage, for I believe God, and it will be as he said. Okay. What is the difference? Why did Paul, in the midst of all this hopelessness, one in 276 people had hope? I'll tell you the difference. Because he felt the presence of God. Because he heard the voice of God saying, don't be afraid. Oh, I'm going to get you to Rome. I told you where I was taking your life. You're going to get there. He trusted the goodness of God. He trusted in that goodness. Because of my goodness, Scripture says, all 276 of you sailors and prisoners, etc., on this boat are going to be saved. There's a quote by Victor Raymond Edmond that says, um, don't never doubt in the dark what God told you in, a light, in the light. Sometimes in darkness, we let go of, of God's nature. We let go of truth. Well, God, I guess you're not a very good God. Look at this. You're not, don't doubt that. Don't doubt what he's spoken when it gets dark, when the winds of hurricane force are coming against you. He says, Paul says this, oh, you're going to arrive safely on land, but we are going to be shipwrecked. We are going to be shipwrecked on an island. Now, what do you think, what do you think people heard? We're going to arrive safely or we're going to be shipwrecked. And they're like, if we're going to be shipwrecked, I'm not staying on this ship. I'm jumping ship. And sometimes life gets so hard, we're like, I'm not staying in this. I'm jumping ship. I am getting out of here. But Paul said, you have to stay on board. Yes, it's hard, but you've got to stay on this ship. That is the only way you will arrive safely. Verse 33, just as day was dawning, Paul urged everyone to eat. You've been so worried that you haven't touched food for two weeks, he said. Please eat something now for your own good, for not a hair of your heads will perish. And then he took some bread and he gave thanks to God before them all and he broke off a piece and ate it. Listen to the outcome. Then everyone was encouraged. Do you know what encourage means? It means to fill with courage. Everyone was filled with courage and they began to eat, all 276 of us who were on board. See, something happens in the hearts of people when they begin to hear that there's a good God, that they begin to see there's, why do you have hope in a hopeless situation? Why? Why are you able to, to navigate, to be steady when everything is unsteady around us? This, we are living proof that there is a good God and his goodness begins to flow through us and his life begins to flow through us through the power of the Holy Spirit. I'm telling you, we are in a time in history and, and I felt this so strongly this week as, as I was just preparing this. It's not gonna be enough to wear the label of Christian to just identify yourself as, yeah, I'm Christian. There is not, it's not gonna be enough, church. And I just pray that God would awaken the spiritually dead, 
that he would get us out of any slumber, any sleepiness, and that we would grip hold and we would, we would tap into the vine, we would press in to knowing Jesus, knowing his word like ever before, because a world around us is gonna be in desperate need of us and, and our lives, the only way we will be steady with the hurricane force winds that I really believe are coming, the only way we will be steady and safe as we're anchored and we feel the presence of God and we hear the voice of God and we know the goodness of God and that's gonna hold us and that's gonna get us safely to the destination that God has for our lives. I believe it to my core. It says this, the centurion ordered those who could swim to jump overboard first and to get to land. The rest were to get there on planks and on other pieces of the ship. And in this way, listen to this, it came true just as Paul had prophesied. Everyone arrived safely on land. Now, I, I just started thinking, I wonder if Paul was one that, that jumped overboard and began swimming or if he was one of the guys like that was gripping for dear life to the plank and bobbing along to the shore, you know, or being swept like boogie boarding when you don't know how to boogie board, just like getting to the shore. We don't know. You know, it's amazing that it's, that, that believers and non-believers are in the same boat in 2020. The outcome, the internal nature of our, of the peace, the love, the joy, the, the goodness, all of that is what's different. But we're, we're navigating the same storm. We're navigating, we're, we're jumping overboard, we're hanging on, and we're arriving safely at shore. Now, the shore that, you, you might say, this is August 2nd, and this is not where I thought I was gonna be, August 2nd. Like, I am so far beyond, we've lost so much time. We've lost so much time this year. I just, I thought things were gonna be different. When I set out the goals for this year, it didn't look like what it does right now on August 2nd. This looks so different, but here I am. And I'm sitting here safely. I'm in my home, I'm alive. I'm here in this, I'm, I'm, I've arrived safely. Now, where was here for Paul? It was, he was on a 17 mile by nine mile strip of land that was not on the course to Rome, by the way. It was an island called Malta. And I love what, what happened to Paul. Um, well, actually, let me just read this. I love Paul's heart. God had poured out his goodness and, and Paul was reflecting something. Sometimes we need to trust God's goodness even when we can't trace it even when it's got us to a place we didn't think that it was gonna, that this is where I was gonna go. God, I'm gonna trust your goodness even when I can't trace your goodness. And God pours out his love, his goodness. Maybe it doesn't look like you thought it would, but God is so committed to pouring out his goodness when people least deserve it and least expect it. And I think that's what this island of Malta experience is all about. Here was a people living in spiritual darkness, not on Paul's radar, just a little blip of land in the middle of the ocean that they end up on. And Paul begins, the prisoners' lives are spared, that's God's goodness. And instead of complaining about all these setbacks that, man, this isn't where I wanted to be by August 2nd, Paul begins serving. It says right here, that Paul began gathering, as Paul gathered an armful of sticks and was laying them in the fire, a poisonous snake driven out by the heat bit him on the hand. Okay, I've just survived all of this and now I'm serving God. I'm serving in the setback. I'm just gonna, I'm not gonna sit on the, on the, beach and just complain like, God, where am I right now? This is not in route to Rome. I feel it in my bones. I'm not where I thought I was going to be, but I'm God, I'm just going to serve in this setback. And then I'm bit by a snake. It latched on to his hand. I heard Christine Kane. She's an evangelist. 
out of Australia. And she said, you know, she was reflecting on this, this passage right here, something I'd never heard before, that, you know, if circumstances can't get to us, the enemy will try to get his venom in us to destroy us from the inside out with bitterness, with dissension, with division, with, with quarreling, with offense. And I love what Paul did. It says he shook it off. Now the people are like, you know, they see him get bitten and they're like, he was a murderer. You know what? If this storm couldn't take him out, <laughs> a snake will. But then he doesn't die. So what's their next? They're, they just, the pendulum's just swinging all over the place. They're like, he's a God, he's a God. And, you know, I can only imagine, it doesn't say how Paul handled that, but I, we know his heart, so we know how he handled that. I want to go on to verse 7. Near the shore where we landed was an estate belonging to Publius, the chief official of the island. He welcomed us and, ki- and treated us kindly for three days. And as it happened, okay, nothing just happens. But I love how this is written. As it happens, Publius's father was ill with fever and dysentery. So Paul went in and prayed for him and laid hand, his hands on him and he healed him. See, no matter where we're at, when we are anchored to the goodness of God, this isn't the place I thought I was doing ministry, but it's the Spirit of God in us just keeps serving and keeps ministering wherever we're at. He laid hands on him and he healed him. And then all the other sick people of the island came and they were healed. We're talking a national revival on an island that wasn't even in the radar, but it was on God's radar. And we don't see where, you know, why is this ship going this direction and this direction and busting apart and doing all this? Well, because God's goodness pours out on those that aren't even on our radar. He's like, I love them with an everlasting love. I want to bring them into a place of undeserved privilege and kindness and life. Like I've brought you into that place. Here's verse 10. And as a result, we were showered with honors. And when the time came to sail, there was a time that God would say, now your course, my path, you've always been on my path, but the course looked differently. Now let's bring you to your destination. The time came to sail and the people supplied us with everything that we would need for the trip. A new boat, new tackle, new supplies. This might be one of my favorite verses in all of scripture. It's Acts 28, verse 14. And so we came to Rome. God got me there. Not by the pathway that I had planned, not on the timetable that I outlined, but with greater resolve, with indestructible courage, with incredible trust and profound joy, I arrived in Rome. God got me to my destination. And when you turn, Acts 28 is the last chapter in the book of Acts. You turn the page and there is the beginning of Romans. Well, there was no way that I could just end Acts 28 and not just drive through Romans because when Paul opens the book of Romans and he says, I know I've been chosen by God to be an apostle, sent out to preach the good news, do you know the conviction that he said that with? I mean, you cannot go through a storm and and through, you know, a shipwreck and through a snake bite and live through it and go, I don't think God has a purpose for my life. Are you kidding me? He had such a fire. I know that I know that I know I've been chosen by God to preach the good news of a good God who came to reconcile man with God. I know, what does that fruit of God's goodness, oh, we feel it to us, but what does it look like when it flows through us? Here's what I think. If we look, if we just reflect back on what we just read, it's steady in the midst of turmoil. It steadies itself in God spoke to me. God spoke to me, God, I'm steadying myself with, with you. There's a higher authority than what's going on around us. And God, I'm steadying myself in that. It makes us dispensers of hope in the midst of hopeless situations. You and I become a dispenser of hope to a generation around us. It gives courage to those who are anxious. This is not the course I thought I would be on. 
It allows a world to view a good God. Those, those 276 people, let me tell you, I don't think their lives were ever the same. They saw firsthand, they experienced the goodness of God. What does goodness look like when it pours through us? It serves in the midst of setbacks. It's not complaining, it's serving. It's not looking at oh, all this was lost. You know what, God, I don't care about all that's been lost. You're gonna take care of me. God, I'm just gonna serve in the midst of this setback and it ministers in the detours. Well, I'm on, my, I'm on Malta. I wonder what God has, to, has for me to do here. Let's find out. God, okay, we're, we're drifting. What do you have for my life right now? This is not what I thought it would look like. But here's the beauty. When we allow God's goodness to pour through us, it experiences national revival. I believe that's what our culture will see, is a national revival. God uses the craziest obstacles, the craziest obstacles to reveal his goodness. I'll never forget, Gary and I were going to Africa, and we were... It was Thursday, we were leaving on Sunday. Gary would be leading worship at, at a conference down there in Cape Town, South Africa. I was speaking at a women in ministry event down there and we knew God had called us to go and, um, but we were leaving our four little ones behind. And so, you know, there was some apprehension and stuff, but we were just, we were preparing to go Thursday right before we were leaving. I called my friend and, and she had been to Africa several times. So I said, okay, just shout out some things. I wanna make sure I have everything I need packed. And so she was going through a list. I said, yep, check, 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 check. And then she, right before she hung up, she goes, oh, and don't forget your passport. I'm like, I don't have a passport. Gary and I don't have a passport. It's amazing who God uses, isn't it? You know, just, I'm standing here to just testify if God can use me, he can use any of us on the planet. So I said, oh, wow, I've got to go pick up a passport. It's Thursday, okay? We're leaving Sunday right after church. So I look in the yellow pages. This is before iPhones, before everything. You've got to get that context. You know, life is a little bit easier now. It's still not that easy to get a passport in a day. But so I called um, and they said, well, you just need to drive to Chicago seven hours away. You need to drive to Chicago with your um, original birth certificates and a second form of ID. And, and I'm like, well, where do you get your original birth certificates? We didn't even have those. So I'm on, my Thursday has just like, talk about shipwrecked, man. We're just like taking a ride that I didn't even think we would be doing. And, and so I call my mom and dad and, and they overnight express the birth certificate, my birth certificate, up north, one hour north, we had relatives in Gurney, Illinois. So we would leave at like three in the morning, drive the seven hours, get, get to my cousin's house, get my birth certificate, drive back down to the federal. We had it all planned out. Let's just say this. If you need a birth certificate in a day, I hope that you were not born in Los Angeles County because I spoke to Everyone in the county records department says it's just impossible. He, you can't get Gary's birth certificate right now. You can't get it in a day. We can do an emergency one within two weeks. You can't get it in a day. I said, listen, listen, I, my husband and I are going to Africa on Sunday. I need a passport. I need that birth certificate. They said, well, drive over your, um, your uh, copy of your airline and proof that you're doing a conference over there. I go, drive over, we're in Michigan. We're in Detroit, Michigan. Now, you, you couldn't just, you know, we didn't have those tiny scanners on our phone and you just send it. No, we go to a Kinko's to do this, send it to a Kinko's over there. Gary's dad drives two and a half hours over by the time they've profit, uh, processed it. FedEx is closed. I mean, we just saw miracle after miracle because he followed a FedEx truck, paid the guy extra money. The guy, I mean, I don't know what all happened, but by the time we got to Gurney, Illinois, Gary's birth certificate was there. We were already just worshiping God and his goodness. Like, God, you're, you're doing something here. Mine never showed up. Mine got caught in a blizzard 
In New York, all the planes were grounded. They couldn't get my birth certificate over there. And so we're just like interceding, like, God, you've just got to work a miracle. At 2 p.m. up in Gurney, Illinois, I call the post office. Oh, it just arrived. We drive over there, get it. We hit uh, rush hour traffic. We get to the federal building. It closes at 4 p.m. We get there at 345. Gary just drops me off because here's what we discovered. There's no parking a mile from the federal building for good reasons. So Gary drops me off with his birth certificate, his driver's license. He goes, I'll go find parking. You just get it started. And I go up to the guard and he says, he goes, um, can I help you? I go, yeah, I've got to get a passport really quick before you close. Oh, well, let, we'll get you some paperwork. Come back Tuesday. Oh. Do you see this birth certificate right here? This was supposed to take two weeks to get here, but here I'm standing with it. This one was caught in a blizzard in New York, but here I'm standing through rush hour traffic, through the guard at the door. He gave me legal cuts to the front of the line. He, I, he, I got, went up to a gal and, and he says, just get her application going for her passport. So she finishes up and I'm at the next window. It's now five minutes to four. And a gentleman says, how can I help you? And he's cleaning his, his whole desk, it's all cleaned off. And I said, well, I just need you to finish processing this. I've got to get my passport real quick. He goes, you'll be at the top of the stack Tuesday morning. I said, what is your name? And he goes, uh, my name's Clyde. I go, Clyde. I said, Clyde, I want you to know something. We were just caught in rush hour traffic. And I spent an hour and a half praying that God would send us to someone who would accomplish his purposes and of all the people in this entire federal building, Clyde, he picked you. So I can't leave here till you get me a passport. And I'm telling you, he just started working on it. It's, you know, here's the thing. God has not given us a spirit of timidity, but of power and of love and a sound mind. And we had come this far. This was no time to get timid and shy about what we needed. And so he gets in and I swear my little oath, you know, and, and that you have to do like this. And so I swore my oath and he goes, where's Gary? I go, I'm just going to swear the oath for him. He's out trying to find parking. He goes, I need him here. So I run back to my friend, the guard at the door. And I have the, I said, see this picture here on this driver's license. Please do not lock this door until he gets through here. We've got to get, he's got to swear the oath so we can get his passport. He goes, I know your God wants you to get to Africa, <laughs> but listen, I have sworn allegiance to the federal government of the United States of America to guard these doors and to make sure they are closed at 4 p.m. and not one second sooner. So if God wants you to get to Africa, he's gonna have to get your husband's feet through these doors in about a minute and a half. Oh man, I go back up to Clyde and I'm like, Clyde, you gotta be praying with me. And I'm just, we're just praying and all of a sudden, it's like, th I see the sweep hand, it's just coming up to the floor. And you know, we just needed like a soundtrack, like Rocky or you know, Chariots of Fire or something. Gary comes running through the door and Clyde's like, I cannot believe this. So Gary swore his, his oath thing and, and he escorted us into this little room and then walked out and we were waiting for the, the passport itself to be made. And he came back in. There was another gentleman in there too. And he said, I want you to know what just happened in here does not happen in the federal building. He goes, but there was something that hit me when you said that you had been praying for me and that God had chosen me. He goes, the spirit of God that must be in you is bearing witness with the spirit of God in me. And he included me in this. He got to see the good, he was experiencing the goodness of God. Well, just as he's sharing this, this little man, jumps up. He'd been in that room waiting for his passport. He jumps up. Glory to God. Glory to God. While he was fighting for you, he was fighting for me. His story looked, mine looked like a cakewalk. And he had to get to Korea by Sunday. And here's the thing. God is so good that I know while he was working out the intricate details of our story, he was working out the intricate details within every storm, every circumstance, all over the globe, because that's how good God is. And that's what he says, I want it to flow through you. I believe God wants to so awaken us and so tether 
us to his life like never before. Through, I'm telling you, reading the word of God is not just something you do, it's the blood of God, the power of God flowing in and through you. The life of God to produce fruit so we can feel his presence, so we can hear his voice, so we can stand strong and steady. We need it because I believe that God, he wants to awaken the dead. He wants to awaken the dead and he wants to bring through us a national, an international revival, a spiritual awakening that, that our world is hemorrhaging for. It's crying out for, and it starts with us. I want us to do something today. I want us to just go into prayer, but I want us, I, it's so fitting, it's so fitting that today we would be talking about God's goodness and it's a communion Sunday. I'm like, God, of course it is. It just happened to be. That we would reflect on all that you've done for us on your good, in your goodness. So if you would just take out this bread through Jesus' death, through his resurrection on the cross, he has reconciled us to God. He has made us friends with God. He's made us children of God. He's brought us into this place of undeserved privilege by which we now stand and we stand fast and we get to celebrate his goodness today and we get to remember, we get to remember what he's done. So would you take that bread and God, we just say thank you. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for sending Jesus. Thank you for giving us your Holy Spirit. Thank you for conquering death, hell, and the grave on our behalf, God. Thank you for your love for a world that is at animosity with you right now. And God, I pray that your reconciliation would flow in us, would flow through us, that God, we would live our lives with your love and your joy and your peace and your patience and your kindness and oh, your goodness and your gentleness, your self-control, oh God. Fill us up with your spirit like never before. We will ask for an outpouring of your spirit in our lives. We love you, Jesus, and we thank you for this gift of your life in us. Let's go ahead and partake together. And then just go ahead and, and grab the cup. God, there's an old song that says your blood will never lose its power. same power that reached in to a corrupt O'Grady family and rescued my dad and our family and washed us of all unrighteousness. God, it just keeps reaching. It reaches not just to us, but God, may, may your blood reach through us to a world that is corrupt and opposed to you, God. Would you use our lives to show this world what you look like? I pray left and right that people would keep getting mistaken for Jesus, man, that we would just be so full of you that your nature would just keep pouring through us, God, and that we would show the world what you look like. Thank you for your blood that cleanses us, that washes us, that makes us brand new moment after moment after moment you're doing your good work in us and we love you and we thank you for that in jesus name let's partake together can you stand with me as we just now um, just worship god and we celebrate his goodness together as we close out our